Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back from the break. I hope you're ready for the final and fascinating fourth panel session here at the Eurasian Media Forum. President George W. Bush um, was accused of making up and using totally nonsensical and non-existent words and phrases. Uh, these Bushisms, as they became known, included gems such as misunderestimated. Well, since the Trump presidency in the USA, we've got a new set of words and phrases added to the lexicon of American English. Alternative facts and fake news are just two examples, but there is a deeper story here, the story of how information has become an even greater weapon than ever, and the technology that uh, propagates it is changing faster than ever. So we ask, can truth prevail? Let's explore exactly what's going on with uh, a person highly experienced and qualified to moderate this discussion, TV host and journalist from Al Jazeera English, Jane Dutton. Good afternoon. Getting here was a bit of a problem into the country. It should have been a short trip to Abu Dhabi and then directly here, but I had to circumnavigate the globe to get here because I'm living in Qatar at the moment and the country is under, some say siege, some say embargo. And this has been imposed on it by the friendly neighbors of Saudi Arabia. UAE and as far as Egypt, and that means they've cut ties, they've cut relations, they've, cut, they've blocked airspace, they've blocked the borders. And this has been a long time coming, there's been a feud brewing for many years, and just today, three weeks after the siege began, the blockade began, the list of complaints and demands was handed over, and basically, the countries want to bring Qatar in like the renegade sun and, and run it like a, a grocery store. And what has exacerbated this problem that has been decades in the making is a situation that we are all in, that the world is facing. It's been exacerbated by fake news, by alternative facts, by propaganda. And of course, Donald Trump had a, a little bit part to play in it, and he's really kicked the hornet's nest when it comes to alternative facts and how we understand the world. He's upended our reality. And he's made a lot of us ask, can truth prevail? We've got a stunning panel to discuss this topic, and I'm going to call them up one by one. Dauren Abayev, Minister of Information and Communication of the Republic of Kazakhstan. Welcome. You've worked in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, closely with the President of the Republic of Kazakhstan, a state inspector in the presidential administration, and you've been holding this job for a year. Shelby Coffey III, <laughs> Vice Chair of the Museum USA and a Senior Fellow of the Freedom Forum. I mean, you really are a newsman, a TV man, to the core, former editor of the Los Angeles Times, president of CNN Business News and CNN FN, executive vice president of ABC News. You've won five Pulitzer Prizes. That's extraordinary. Finalist for the award for 25 of those prizes. And uh, I bet you could tap dance too. Right. <laughs> right, you had a bit to play. Catherine Cano. A broadcaster and media manager from Canada, recipient of the highly regarded WCT Innovator of the Year Award. She was also honored as one of Canada's top 100 most powerful women by the Women Executive Network. You've gone from Parliament Hill to CBC, SRC, Al Jazeera, and now you're with CPAC. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that later on. Giles Cunningham, MBE. Founder of Trafalgar Square Strategy. I believe that's only been running for about four months. Hopefully it'll run a lot longer after this chat. Former head of press at number 10 Downing Street. Spokesman to the UK Prime Minister David Cameron. You've also director of communications for the Conservative Party's general election win in 2015. You dealt with sex scandals and political scandals too. Welcome. Shahida Tulaganova. This is where we really get the ground view. She's been a journalist for more than 20 years, BBC Central Asian program. You moved to BBC Television News, the Features Desk, BBC's Current Affairs. 
You've reported from Central Asia, the Caucasus, Ukraine, Israel, Turkey, and the occupied Palestinian territories. You've also been awarded a couple of awards for uh, Best docu Documentary, Airport Donetsk, and How to Plan a Revolution. So welcome to all of you. Dauren, if we can start with you and tell us about the state of misinformation that we are in at the moment, and why do you think we've got here? Good evening, distinguished colleagues. I'm happy to greet everyone here in Astana, here the Eurasian Media Forum in this wonderful building, in a beautiful expo. Welcome. It's a very interesting theme. We can talk for a long time about it. I've been going through these things, and I'm uh, confused with some things. I'm confused with the number of people in the audience, and I think this theme and everything that's being said uh, should be of interest to everyone, especially to uh, journalists of Kazakhstan, and there should really be more people. Second thing that confuses me is the overall agenda of the Eurasian Media Forum. I believe that the agenda should perhaps be somewhat narrowed down generally. It's my vision of the minister, and I get to say those things. As a delegate uh, here to this forum, uh, it'd be hard to say if I had been the minister. Now, everything that was said here is absolutely right. Everything that I heard here, the world is changing. It's changing rapidly. And we, we see everything changing. The thinking, the uh, very perception of the world. We have 20 million messages on WhatsApp a minute, we get 3 million uh, clicks on YouTube a minute. And according to experts, uh, the fact that we're living now, uh, uh, before you would fit in 31 hours, we managed to squeeze it in 24 hours of physical time. It means that we are witness that our attention is more and more becoming fragmented, and uh, professors in, of universities complain about that a lot, that the students' uh, attention span is uh, has fallen a victim of all this flow of information. As one American comedian says, there are a lot of smartphones, but there are less smart people. Yeah. Today, I think that uh, a very important challenge we're facing is that despite the fact that there's a tremendous uh, a tide of information covering us uh, with our heads, there are, there's a lot of different uh, ways of providing information. There are more ways of manipulating people, and that's the challenge we're facing today. Manipulations happen by fraudsters and by destructive forces and manipulations may be more and more crafty. The more there is information, the harder it will be people to use all of that. And today, I was at their presentation here in Expo uh, where they said that in the future, basically next year, actually sooner, end of this year, they'll launch a high-speed internet in trains in Kazakhstan, which will let people watch uh, stream uh, uh, stream videos, go to their uh, uh, social media. And I thought this is not exactly very good because in the time, those 20 hours that uh, it took me to take a train back in the day between Almaty and Sanaa, which is 1,200 kilometers, I managed to read a couple of books going one way and two books going other way because those nothing really else to do. And now that means that more and more people will become uh, visual in their learning, who learn information only through entertainment content. And methods are becoming craftier and craftier, and they will change and evolve and will become worse in their nature. And I also think that the development of new technologies is good, but at the same time, one should perhaps be very careful with these things. For um, more and more, as our uh, minister is not looking only after mass media, but we also look after communication matters. Uh, so it's uh, internet and any communication. And I think that stories of great uh, 
uh, science fiction writers are now shaping up uh, every day. People in Kazakhstan, uh, many unfortunately, uh, haven't perhaps realized yet that okay, what big data many is. Topics, and I'm going to pick up on some of those. Shelby. Thank you. I, I... Say, why don't we address fake news a bit at the start, since that is a topic of, of great interest. George Orwell wrote a wonderful essay I recommend to everyone called Politics and the English Language, in which he notes that as soon as a term enters the, the political side of the language, it becomes drained of meaning. It becomes taken over by various factions. And fake news started out meaning one thing, that is something that was absolutely not true, that was injected into the system, and now has come to often be used uh, in the political discourse as a story I don't like, uh, or s a slant I don't agree with, which is a different thing. I think it is important to remember that fake news has always been with us from just arbitrarily to take the Roman times, uh, they would put papyrus up on the forum and stories including uh, wonderful amounts of sexual slander of rivals uh, would go up. Uh, their two favorite topics were divorce and crime. And you see throughout uh, all of our sense of news from then on to now, uh, news is about what get, gets our attention. It's about how we explain the world from one end of the spectrum, what's most important, uh, to what is just purely interesting. From one end, say, nuclear proliferation to what Kim Kardashian did last night. No social relevance in particular, other than it's just interesting to some people. And what we have entered into now, uh, when news post-Roman times uh, moved into the 1600s and the first, uh, uh, ironically, the, the first newspaper was printed in Strasbourg uh, by a smart guy who wanted to develop a monopoly. He wanted to be the only guy to do it. Uh, you then entered into an industrial age in which you had much more, ever larger concentrations, and certainly in the main broadcast TV era, that was true. We are now, because of the technological age, we are shifting back. In other words, you had gatekeepers then, you have much more of the Tower of Babel now. Every man is, uh, is his own publisher, every woman her own broadcaster, as we see uh, live on Facebook. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg's idea was to put the world in communication, allow everyone to develop communities or go one-to-one -one or one-to uh, a variety. Now, in just to take one statistic, in the U.S., Facebook is used as a major source of news by 60% of the people, the major source by 20% of the people, and your editors now have become your friends, people who send you that. Uh, or people of like-minded. Uh, hence, you have the, the echo chamber effect and the filter bubble effect. And once uh, the internet was set up, uh, and I've actually taken Vint Cerf, uh, one of the inventors of the internet, through the museum, and you are all invited to the museum when you come <laughs> to Washington. It's a great place with 15 galleries and 15 theaters and a temple to the First Amendment, which was free expression. Vint Cerf invented the internet for communication, but not for protection. And it is one of the th interesting twists that with all of our technological age, we are now much more like we were prior to the industrial age, more like in Roman times, where every man, every woman presents his, her own rumors, and it spreads through the forum. Should we leave it on that pendulum swing, Catherine? We can Catherine? leave it on that. Yeah, yeah, you touched a lot of good points, uh, Shelby. And uh, uh, so if I can add to this, I think um, we are at a turning point um, that we actually lost control over accuracy and credibility of information. 
there's so much confusion between real and fake news, and I think it's worth spending a bit of time on that because mm. it's not small. It's not small. It's huge. Um, and the fact is, um, I, and I'm sure if we were to ask everyone here, do, can you spot? fake news, a false story. And most of us would say, oh yeah, I think I can spot that. And we did, there was a, a, a poll uh, in Canada la last month, and 80% of Canadians said, oh no, no, I can spot you know, uh, false news or fake news. And then when they were put into the test, they had six examples, 63% failed the test. <laughs> so it's just to tell you that it's sneaky. It's not something that you necessarily, sometimes the headlines look real. The Huffington Post, uh, right after the election, did a, a test and they said, uh, they had a headline saying, um, uh, well, Bernie Sanders ca is becoming the next president. There is a loophole. We found a loophole. And as soon as you got into the story, they were saying, oh, wait a minute, this is not true. But have you already shared it? And most people had shared it. Uh, and that's what happens is that people don't necessarily read through it, but they thought the title could be plausible. So. And, and more, uh, and Yale University did a, a big study on that, and more you talk about a story, there's repetition of a story, more it is believable <coughs> and plausible, even if it's not true. Mm -hmm. So I think the phenomenon of, 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 of the confusion is, is real and deep, and technologies are outsmart us. I mean, we haven't catch up, catch, caught up, I should say, to uh, how to handle it, how to actually, and so with the filter bub bubble, which is, you know, you hear uh, or you, you are fed the, the news or the information you want to hear, uh, which doesn't make you aware of other viewpoints, uh, with the fact that the uh, you know, newsroom are shrinking in terms of you know, the uh, business model is totally uh, out of whack, and we can talk more about that. Um, and the fact that in, 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 in reality, not everyone wants to fix the problem because it's, it's benefits. Uh, you know, you talk about being a weapon. Uh, misinformation uh, helps some people, organizations and politicians. And, and you were mentioning, Shelby, about the fact that um, fake news now is not just fabricated information, it is actually the news you don't want to hear or you don't, you don't want people to hear, even if it's true. So that's becoming a fake news. So I think at the end of the day, it's, we may not be at a point of no return, but we're really at a, it's a major wake-up call. Giles, tell us a bit more about yourself and where you stand as far as this goes. Yeah, I mean, I agree with, uh, with Catherine there. I think the explosion of fake news poses a massive threat to democracy in the East uh, and the West. And really, the internet, whilst it's been a great thing for revolutionizing information uh, and allowing more access to people, it's also a platform for more of this fake news to spread so quickly. And I have to say in this whole debate, I think Facebook is one of the biggest culprits uh, when it comes to fake news. You know, uh, as Shelby said, I think half the population in America consume their news off there. Uh, I think there's two billion people on it in the UK. Uh, I think on average people spend 35 to 40 minutes on, the, on there uh, during the day. It's where people get their news. I think Facebook's position saying, look, we're a carrier, not a publisher, is totally unsustainable. I think it's reckless. I think it's irresponsible. I think they should be subject to stringent safeguards. They've got to uh, accept they are now part of the establishment. They're not uh, a disruptor. Uh, and I think you know, in areas of public safety and public health, there can be huge implications <laughs> if fake news does spread incredibly quickly. I think what we haven't seen in this whole debate is really any coherent answers about how do you tackle it. And I mean, what the panel have, have touched upon already is that you are having politicians use the term very loosely and lazily. I mean, I'd say Trump is the biggest offender there, but I've also seen politicians default to using it in the UK when they don't agree with something, when it's a matter of conjecture. I think that's incredibly irresponsible and they need to be careful there. But I think there are some things that can be done in this area. I think firstly, I'd like to see the rise of more third party groups doing fact checking uh, in the arena. I think there's a big piece of work to be done in the schools with children uh, about you know, educating them about the veracity of sources and how they check uh, information out. I think you know, there should be a big drive to go back towards traditional news sources uh, that we can trust you know, and have got, uh, you know, have got great reputations. And I think ultimately, you know, maybe, and I'm not in favor of state regulation of the media at all, but some pressure needs to be put on Facebook, be it from the government, if they don't get their house in order. Because what we can't see is an absolutely horrific situation occurring 
through Facebook, uh, through fake news being spread on Facebook and Facebook not acting? Shahida? Well, um, my mom is a doctor. She has nothing to do with politics, but she always wants to catch up with me on the phone. So whenever she comments ridiculous things, which she sometimes says to me as, a comment, as opposed to as regards to the Russian politics, I say, Mama, where did you get it? She said, I read it on the internet. <laughs> and that's the biggest argument. I read it on the internet, therefore it's truth. Now, I work in the field, and until recently I worked in a, a news organization which broadcasts in Russian language, but funded by the US Congress. And our job was to tackle fake news generated by Russian media. And I have to say, but for the, for the three years observing reporting of different news channels, including Russia, I have to say not only politicians, but we as journalists are used um, as also part of propaganda machine. Unfortunately, every single country which is a little bit of dictatorship, say Russia, uh, Turkey, China, has um, a privilege of opening, or setting, launching a news channel and broadcast to the world their point of view. But let me tell you the, um, the damage uh, this fake news, or propaganda, I call it, uh, creates. During the, ongo during the um, active phase of Ukrainian-Russian war in 2014, Russian TV broadcast a very um, sensitive episode where a blonde woman who was dressed in white was describing how Ukrainian army was crucifying a seven-year-old child. And she said it in a situation, she was crying and she looked very, very genuine. Now, we tried to find the boy. The boy exists, nothing happened to him. The woman, in fact, was participating, was acting in few of those, this kind of reports, testifying of horrendous violence committed, allegedly committed by the Ukrainian soldiers. The damage was done incredible. The sentiment in Russian public, because you know, in Russia you have like state channels which pretty much broadcast the same propaganda in different ways and forms, um, was incredible. So everyone was saying how horrible, how violent, how barbaric Ukrainians are. But nobody was saying what the opposite side is doing in um, the occupied those separatist areas. Um, and it's going on over and over again. And unfortunately, I have to say, not only politicians are to blame for creating the fake news. We as journalists also becoming part of the story in terms of, I call it cowboy journalism, when people go with the set mind, create a set mindset where we have baddies and goodies, like for example, in coverage of the Syrian war, which I found incredibly appalling because Western media didn't have um, access to the Syrian, control, Syrian government controlled territories. We had access to the opposition controlled territories, therefore, therefore we cannot verify news from either side. So we have to believe one side. And the whole reporting went black and white. And unfortunately, this is an, a common narrative. As it is bad, opposition is good. And everyone who covered the war knows that this is not the case. The same with Ukraine. I'm not pro-Ukrainian, I'm not anti-Ukrainian, I'm not pro-Russian or pro-separatist, but when we try to investigate the story and deliver the story to the audiences, this is what is missing in modern journalism. We became a little bit lazy. So lazy, it touches people in so many ways, and I'm sure that you've got lots of questions to ask. I just want to let you know that towards the end, I am going to open it up to you. So um, just make notes, and um, I will get back to you a, a little later on in the conversation. So uh, Shelby, talk, talk me through it. How does it work? You, you get facts, uh, use a little conjecture, and bam, there it is. It's important to make some separation between the types of journalism. There has always been opinion journalism, and uh, certainly in the 20th century, mainstream journalism was the journalism of verification. The ver and so going to sources, looking at the track record of those sources, uh, objectivity which was created, interestingly, as the gold standard after the Soviet revolution in 1917 and Walter Lippmann uh, in, uh, in, the, in America decided that some reporters who had fallen too much in love with I have seen the future and it works and said we should adopt scientific method, uh, adapt it to journalism and, sh and so you must show where you got the facts, according to whom, and show how you put the facts together. That became a gold standard, but it has always coexisted with opinion journalism. What was the problem that he was trying to overcome. It was reporters who were using 
news because they had fallen in love with a particular outcome. This is a, a problem, and it has now showed up uh, in massive ways because the disinterested reporter, the one who is looking at the facts, uh, is often left behind by the emotional appeal to patriotism, to, uh, as we just heard, a particular uh, atrocity, whether real or not, can stir people up. We are emotional people and uh, always have been. There is a Roman uh, aphorism. I'm big on the Romans because I had Latin jammed into me as a Go military ahead. cadet for <laughs> six years. Uh, but there was a lot of wisdom there. And they said, the world wants to be deceived, and so it is. And a lot of reasons that fake news is believed by audiences is it reinforces their perceptions or it reinforces their sense of gain to be gotten. And Darren, uh, traditionally it was thought that it would sort of be the dictatorships or the strong men who would benefit from this kind of fake news, but what we're finding is that it's pro proliferated everywhere. Where do you think it sits most comfortably and what makes it succeed? Could you please repeat the question? Fake news could traditionally have been described as something that the strongmen of the world, the, the dictators, would use to uh, quell dissent, to keep people down, to know exactly what's going on. But what we are finding, what we are seeing certainly now, is that it's across the board. It's, it's, it's relevant and fervent in democracies. Is, is there a reason why this is, you think it's gained traction in all of these countries, so much so at the moment? I think that the situation with fake news is somewhat overestimated. One, two, three pieces of news don't play such a big role, I think that our society will be able to digest it and will get over it. Another thing, as you were rightfully saying, if there are some strong men in this world and if they're building up a certain system, I think that that might pose a threat. If it is the system when all the mass media, internet, TV, would talk about the same thing, start talking about the same thing, then certainly that would mean a manipulation, as I said before, and that would need to be uh, fought against. I'm absolutely sure that the, the strong man in this world is uh, dictators in various countries will pay attention to the following, uh, to such things. However, putting in one or two pieces of fake news is not interesting for them because it will be uncovered and it will fire back at them. Okay, it might be uncovered. Catherine, I mean, look, look what happened during Trump's inauguration. And I was there and I remember interviewing one of our correspondents, Patty Colhane, and she was standing on this, this lawn and there was, and I said, Patty, what's going on? And she said, absolutely nothing. There's nobody here. And then obviously we've been hearing about, you know, the extraordinary numbers more so than Obama. The truth does come out, the, the fake news does come out. D does it have a negative effect though, other than breaking trust, but that doesn't seem to matter anymore? Well, it's a big risk to take, I think, because it does, it maybe it comes through once in a while, but it doesn't come through the rhythm that it's actually out there. And even some people will still believe that there were, uh, I don't know, a million people at the inauguration, whatever number that President Trump used. So, I mean, there's going to be the septics, and, and media are not trusted. I mean, the trust in media has gone down. So, it's, it maybe it's actually coming back up, uh, you know, now, but it's, it's slowly. So, I, I think, um, you know, we cannot underestimate the control of information, the power it gives. And I think that it, uh, you know, today, the, the, the White House has actually uh, forbid, forbidden the uh, cameras in the White House briefing uh, room. For, for, it's not the first time, but they, so it's control, right? It's a, and what's the role of journalists? What's the role of those media organizations that actually uh, have studied and, and have uh, standards and, uh, you know, and, uh, and uh, practices that uh, have to abide by certain rules is that um, we have actually dismissing 
their, their, their role, which is to make those governments or the organizations accountable. So if you create this, 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 this informa disinformation um, system and structure, and it's almost systematic now that every day you hear the word, every day it turns like, is that true, is it not true? Mm -hmm. You create this confusion where people don't know what to believe anymore. And they're certainly not going to believe the media first. And so it's, it's, I think it's a risk, it's too big a risk to take it lightly and to not think that it's actually quite powerful and the people are very determined, even in our democracies, even where there is democracy, it's all very fragile, I think. Giles, how does it work? You worked with David Cameron. He called a, a binary referendum. Possibly it was a, a, you know, shouldn't have been called that way, a lot more nuanced, imposed on, on a public that possibly didn't understand it. How much truth and sleight of hand was there there? Um, yeah, it was an incredibly divisive campaign. I don't think anyone would, uh, would argue on that. I think that there was a lot of conjecture knocking around, there was a lot of nuance in the campaign. I suppose there was one thing which stood out was, which uh, was fundamentally untrue, which was pushed by the vote leave, the Brexit side, was that uh, if we left Europe, there would be 350 million pounds that would be pumped into the right. NHS. That was fundamentally untrue. Um, the politicians who used those it arguments- it stuck, didn't it? It did stick, it, it got cut through. And I think uh, I'd say a couple of things on this, you know, there wasn't really, as I, was, as I said at the start, there wasn't really a robust third party who could hold them to account, like almost a media regulator. And, you know, at time there was talk about, oh, we should take them to court over this. But, you know, we hadn't got time to do that because the campaign was moving at breakneck speed and by the time you'd have got to court, uh, you know, the campaign would have, would have been over. So I think, yeah, we suffered from having a robust third party group holding them, holding them to, to, to account. And... You know, look, the politicians who use those figures, they're still, uh, they're still, uh, it's still brought up in interviews now. I think it's going to come back to bite them. They still haven't got coherent answers uh, to those questions. And I think it had a very corrosive effect uh, on public trust. And they were doing a disservice to the public. Now, whether it was a game changer uh, in the referendum, I think it's impossible to say, and maybe it wasn't. But um, yeah, it was probably one of the most sort of divisive campaigns I have, I, have, I have fought. I mean, what was good about the general election which just happened in the UK was you didn't really see fake news play a prominent role. And she I did it, it all herself. Sorry? Ther Theresa May did it all herself. Well, she messed up all on her own. But, yeah. um, but um, I, think, I, I actually think one of the reasons maybe why it didn't really play a prominent role was because it was a snap election. There wasn't time for these third parties, these forces, to get momentum and to get going. I don't think it's a problem that's going to go away because, as everyone's touched upon, the media is fragmenting more and more. People are getting their news from different sources. Young people don't buy newspapers. People don't really watch uh, news programs by appointment anymore. So that's why I think you know, we do need to do more in the schools or there needs to be a wider education program around the veracity of sources so people really question where they get information from look what's there and also perhaps look at having two or three sources when they look to get to get to get the right information Shahida, do you think there's a problem in the makeup of politicians the fact that when you become a politician and you rise up in the ranks that you have to start conforming and therefore you start putting your beliefs aside and realizing that you have to take on more spin I actually never met a politician with a solid belief system, unfortunately. Uh, I think the moment you become a politician, you set your belief system aside and you try to conform into what is fashionable, what can bring you to power. Um, it's a very sad thing to say, but it's true. Um, um, those good guys I met, they were out of power already, so um, they're not the decision makers, the deciders, as George W. Bush used to say. Mm -hmm. uh, no, it's, it's very sad because they want to win. If you want to win, you need to lie and you need to conform to what is expected from you. Um, and we as journalists, we expect them to lie too. <laughs> you can't, we, I don't trust politicians. Um, and Darren, uh, there's, uh, um, there are many companies, Giles, you are running one of them at the moment, yeah. the, the sort of Bell Pottingers who come in and uh, they shine the product and they, they, they nurture the product 
uh, and they give the product, the person, the party, the tools to be able to um, drive through whatever the trauma is or drive them to the, to, to the winning post. Do you think that plays a factor in obscuring the truth? Of course, it plays its role. I think all of that plays its role, but ultimately, sooner or later, the truth will prevail. And there were certain premises made here regarding the politicians. I'm absolutely sure that if we are to approach many things with common sense and with the willingness to help your own country, then that would be the winning premise. And no matter who and when and come would come, what kind of campaigns would be done later on to refine things, it will never be possible to uh, conceal the genuine motives from the public. I like your positivity. Maybe we should discuss what truth actually means, shall we? I thought the philosophy class was meeting a little later on, <laughs> <laughs> as my philosophy professor said. Um, do you think we can get it? We, can, can truth be lost in, in looking for truth? Can it be obscured? I think, I think it absolutely is. As my philosophy professor said, Mr. Coffey, talk till you make a point. <laughs> uh, so I, I'll, we still I'll try to freeform a couple of uh, thoughts on that. Uh, we now live in a postmodern age which is different than the Victorian age, where there was a sense, uh, and you will see it in the writing, of capital T truth. Uh, we now know that there are different perspectives on the truth. What, for example, is the Native American Indian sense of truth? I bought a, a T-shirt for a relative of mine who's of part Indian heritage, and it has photographs of Indians saying, fighting terrorism since 1492. Mm -hmm. An interesting different perspective yeah. uh, on, on America. Uh, the, uh, I think the key thing that you can get at in the journalism of verification, where you take it, you're going to get what uh, Woodward and Bernstein of Watergate fame called the best obtainable version of the truth. And there's an important qualification in that, which means that we know people are going to tell us lies sometimes, and by no means just politicians. And I wanna, I wanna speak up briefly for politicians as an embattled class, uh, because uh, my grandfather, for example, was a US senator. And when you see people on the other side, you realize that they are often villainized, or, or, or sainted by the press, depending on the visions, and they are not necessarily those people. They are dealing with a matter of forces, not only from without, but from within themselves, often trying to do better than they may be able to do. And, and their version of the truth, often kind of interesting. Most people are the heroes of their own autobiography. And you will see in uh, books by Washington journalists, you can often tell who has been a good source on confidential things because that person tends to uh, overall be a, a pretty cast in a favorable light. And so uh, it's important to keep humility about getting at the truth, both as a journalist and for historians as well. Uh, I used to think that the judgment of history was some uh, some Olympian term that would sort out. Well, in truth, as we found out with the centenary of World War I in the wonderful book, The Sleepwalkers, there are still a number of major things to be argued about, about how World War I even got started, which changed our modern world. And it set loose the idea, it ended the idea of capital T truth in uh, a, a great deal of Western culture. So I think approaching it and saying you can get close, but never thinking that you get the total truth because often we hide it even from ourselves. Okay, so Dalrin was confident. You say somewhere in the middle. Catherine, when I bumped into you at the airport, you looked at me and you said, we are.
big fat expletive there <laughs> when it comes to can truth prevail? I mean, what is it that frightens you so much about the situation that we are in? Well, I agree with Shelby because I think that that's, you know, truth is, is, is objective reality and, and objectivity doesn't really exist purely. I mean, it's a, we all come with our uh, references and, and knowledge and, and values and even if we, we're doing, I think that journalists are doing their best to make sure that they, they've got all the views and the point of views and, and try to be fair. Um, no, what worries me is, I, in fact, I'm, I'm worried and at the same time I, th I think there are solutions and I think, but it's a, not one, it's, it's many and it's mm -hmm. like, it has to be very powerful and, and strong. But one of the things I think we can, it can help uh, us get close to the truth is, is give context. I think we, we I think one of the things that's missing, uh, has been missing and, and it's, it's, you know, it's, it's a bit, it's nobody's fault really. I think, I think what happened is, a, and Shelby um, talked a little bit about that, is that I remember 30 years ago when I started, uh, we, were, we were the reference, right? We were giving the, the news people needed. Then we became really unpopular and, and we we're told we were dinosaurs, disconnected, we needed to give people the news they wanted. So now today they have the news they want, they don't need us, right? They have access to all kinds of information. It's like the pendulum almost went too far. Mm -hmm. and, and the difference today is that do they get the news they need uh, to make up their own mind? Do they get all the viewpoints so they can actually make a clear decision and, and, and see for themselves what makes sense? You cannot impose people's your own truth or whatever you believe because it's, it is. But if it's ba facts based, I mean, there's no alternative to facts, right? I mean, facts are facts. You can interpret them, of course. You can decide you take that fact versus the other one. There's always room for, for, <laughs> for, for manipulation or for, you know, to, 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 for bias. But uh, I, th I think if you actually give people a chance to have all the information and you, you, you do your job the best you can, but context, I think, is, is, is missing because we went from clip bite instead of, of um, of, of in-depth journalism, and, and there's great journalism out there. I mean, I think that's the problem. There's so much noise, there's so much information, you lose it. You, you, don't, you, you, you miss it. It's impossible to see all of it. But there, are, there is really extraordinary investigation, uh, investigative journalism, uh, stories, great stories. But I think now journalists have understood and media organizations have understood they need to connect with the audience. They need to, to and what that, does that mean? It means to be close to the ground, to actually be in the field, to hear, to listen, to actually, uh, you know, one thing that was missing in, in the U.S. election, and I'm not sure about England uh, for Brexit, but you heard all the stories about why black people voted for Trump in Detroit and why college, educated college women voted for Trump after the facts, not mm. before. Yeah, there were some stories, but it was mostly opinions. And opinions, you know, is, is uh, not necessarily what people want to hear or, or they will go for what they, the ones they want, but it didn't give us the sense of what was really going on. So I think if we, get back, we go back to those basics, uh, but, but we were the real intent to understand the audience, we're, we're so to report on it. I but Shahida, will... sorry, excuse me, jumping in. Shahida, this is what you were talking about a little bit earlier on, what frustrates you about TV news and why you left, the sort of skimming of the surface and what we're missing out. Mm. That's why I quit news. <laughs> um, yeah, I totally agree with you, Karen. I um, have a few points. U.S. elections, we were all covering it. And it was obvious a certain proportion of American populations are going to vote for Donald Trump. And I miss them on news networks. I miss them on CNN. I miss them on the major news channels because they never were given a proper voice. All of a sudden, he wins. I'm like, okay, who are these people who vote for him? And well, it wasn't only my question. A lot of people asked questions like this. We, had, we needed a profile of average Trump voter, and we never had it, at least in international news. Um, I agree with you with context, absolutely. Context keeps missing from the news coverage. We have three minutes news report. Uh, where we have uh, a reporter who tells you the story. And on a good occasion, on a bad occasion, we have just a reporter being interviewed by the anchor <laughs> who tells the story on behalf of the people. May I please hear the people? <laughs> May I please s hear the opinion and see how they live? And that's what keeps missing. Um, I had a conversation with one of my reporters, I had 25 of them, um, who went to Mosul, young girl. So she went to Mosul once, she covered the war, and everyone likes Big Bang, you know, it's a good picture, great picture, capture, captivizes the audience. 
Next time she goes, she says to me, Shahira, I'm going to go back to Mosul. And you know what I realized? Iraq doesn't have civilization and culture. Wow. And I'm like, I was stunned. <sighs> she looks at me and like, oh, compared to Iran. And it was even worse statement because they're both two different civilizations. She never bothered to read a single book about the country she's supposed to cover. And this unfortunately is a trend which has to be prevented. It frustrates me so much that I move to documentaries completely. Because there, you don't need to deal with news, you deal with stories. And Giles, I'm just wondering if this is gonna be made any better with Facebook and choosing stories for you, using algorithms, artificial intelligence. Where does that leave the, the thought process, the control and the truth? I don't know. I mean, I I'm not an expert in that area, but I think what everyone's touched upon here is we do live in a soundbite culture, uh, and that doesn't lend itself to context. But also, you've got the backdrop of the fact that, you know, certainly in the UK, news is not uh, a very valuable commodity anymore. People don't make much money out of it. Uh, less people are consuming, uh, you know, less people are buying newspapers, less people, as I said earlier on, are watching uh, news programs by appointment. So I think that makes the backdrop even harder when you're trying to tackle this because, you know, often you do need context. You know, uh, a lot of politics is about nuance. I know Donald Trump tries to reduce everything to 140 characters. Uh, he sees everything in black and white, but that isn't, you know, that isn't normally the case. I think the one thing, certainly, that governments can do in this space is greater transparency. If you've got greater transparency, uh, around what you're doing, you know, from publishing, for instance, or your expenditure online. At least then, hopefully, you're going to enhance trust, but also look to engage citizens more. And if you can engage them more with the government, uh, with transparency, then hopefully you're going to get more of, the, more of the real story that's going on. All right, let's talk more about solutions, Shelby. You think it should be tackled at a, a young age, this phenomenon? I do, and uh, I, I think, in fact, uh, if I could wave a magic wand, I would say starting in at least middle school, but maybe late grade school, given how much time uh, children spend with their screens and iPads, that media literacy should become an important factor for every country, especially every country with aspirations towards democracy. Why? Because if you look at the best of democracy, it is a way, it is to some extent a marketplace of ideas. It is uh, an argument culture that is set up so that you may have a different view, I may have a different view, we'll fight it out in public and the voters will decide which view prevails. Uh, that is uh, a, an ideal that depends upon education and education depends on being able to discern fact from fiction. Uh, Eric Schmidt, who was for a time the CEO of Google, uh, said that the internet was in one sense a gold mine. You can be incredibly well educated and in another sense a garbage heap because you can go into the worst uh, sorts of things. And I think what Catherine was saying points out one of the things that's the paradox of choice, that you, uh, when you have too many choices, you can, uh, you can either be driven slightly nuts by it or go to the lowest denominator. If people were, it, were trained in this, I think it would help to pull out uh, of the filter bubble. The other thing that I would say is important is to keep in mind the monetary rewards. Uh, what Giles was saying, uh, about living in a soundbite culture also applies to a clickbait culture. Uh, people are attracted to uh, quick things. There have been neurological studies of the reaction to news stories or bites, and the, uh, the neurological fibers simply react more and more to the same sort of thing, which pulls you uh, into a different world than the lengthier and more considered things that would be worthwhile. Uh, I, I would also note that uh, the people at Facebook and Google are not unaware of this. I've talked with a number of high-ranking people there, and they wrestle with it. Google News, for example, I talked, I interviewed Krishna Bharat, who started Google News. 
right after 9-11. Uh, and he was the classic young Indian immigrant to the U.S. who had uh, gotten on with uh, the right tech company, turned out to be Google, and he said, how did this happen? Why did I not have a sense of the world? And that's why Google News, which is a great aggregator of news, uh, was created, and it has been successful. In a sense, in the news world, Facebook may be even more successful because of this element. Google is aggregating, but in Facebook, your friends are aggregating for you, and they are sending you, did you see the story on the Met Gala? Can you believe the dresses and, uh, that were worn? Or can you imagine why the center fielder for the Royals is behaving this way? Whatever your friends are. And that takes, remember, as, as my wife, the emergency room doctor says, remember, honey, your bandwidth isn't getting any bigger. Uh, and so we take, with our limited bandwidth, what we know our friends are going to be talking about. And that takes away. It's, uh, it's the plus of uh, the great one-to-one, -one, hyper-connected world we are in, but also the minus, because it pulls us away from what in the gatekeeper world would have been the loftier and more important looks at major issues. I'm wondering who's got any questions now? And let me know who you would like to address it to. We can address it to them yourselves. I believe we have three microphones heading around over there, the gentleman over there. Uh, thank you. My name is Dr. Shahid Qureshi. I have a PhD on the topic of identity crisis and I'm the editor of London Post. Um, I think uh, in past, uh, since the 9-11, uh, media has become part of the deception and branding and rebranding of terrorism. We, as a media person, we have seen that where victims have been converted into perpetrators. So we see Iraq war, we see Syria, we see Afghanistan. Millions of people have been killed, but yet they are painted as terrorists, wherever we, whichever part of the news we see. I agree with uh, Shahida that some ignorant people were sent to cover the stories, they don't understand. So, uh, and this is what I said to uh, Ambassador Nicholas Burns once. I said, do you want me to tell you something you should know? or do you want me to tell you something you want to hear? Mm. And that's where we are. Um, in, uh, we have uh, 45 minutes, doji dossier. Um, and then we come into the branding and rebranding of terrorism, from Mujahideen to Al-Qaeda to Taliban, the ISIS. Now the people in uh, social media ask this question that how Daesh can or ISIS can travel 2,500 miles to Paris or 5,000 miles to, to Bangladesh, but ISIS doesn't go to Israel. And this is the question they're asking in social media, but no national or international channel is asking that how on earth that uh, it is possible for ISIS to buy four by four from Japan, how they are paying for these cars. Uh, for example, uh, in UK, we say we have a special relationship with the United States. So I asked my colleague, uh, Nick Go uh, 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 from Guardian yesterday, I said, oh, what special relationship we have with the U.S.? He said uh, after the Second World War, they sent a bill to pay to the Britain, and we didn't have any money, so we pay in our gold. So U.S. took the gold uh, from Britain, mm -hmm. and yet we see uh, it as a special relationship. Now, it's, it's, I, I am very confused when we talk about the truth. It's not about the truth. What media has become part of the deception um, part of the tool to uh, where death and destruction has been caused. Uh, okay, sh BBC. should we leave it there? I mean, you're basically saying that there are, many, there are so many players, so many levels. Can I... Can and I and, and it's fine, one final comment. There is no sense of accountability mm. uh, on behalf of the politicians who said 45 minutes uh, uh, or who are lying on uh, live TV channels. Media persons and politicians, they don't have sense of responsibility. So this, uh, uh, your slogan, you have can truth prevail, is not going to work. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Basil Khadjassim, journalist. 
Basil Khaljassan, journalist, I have a brief comment. Uh, what many call uh, uh, social media, it's not exactly right. Uh, I think uh, it's better call it new technologies. Development of these new technologies uh, rapidly let us and let the media pass on anything, but uh, it's not going to be journalism. For instance, uh, take the Middle East. Two or three users in social media, unknown users, no one knows who uses them, start uh, uh, writing about secret meetings of the government, uh, secret activities of special services, and then later those things happen. You can call it whatever you want, but that definitely is not journalism. I don't know whether uh, such accounts in the former Soviet Union countries or in the West. Thank you. I think that's a problem of data manipulation, isn't it? Anyone else? Good evening, Kazakhstan Union of Lawyers, Dina Sulemenova. My question is to our minister, Mr. Abayev. Why you disagree that the problem of fake news today is not acute for Kazakhstan? Just last year, in avoidance of manipulation uh, of consciousness and uh, public opinion and to avoid internal social conflicts and to solve the problem of fake uh, news uh, from legal perspective, Perspective, it was handled like this. Uh, a ban was used for use of smartphones and gadgets by officials uh, uh, while uh, at work. That led to a situation that basically when any crisis situation happens or a confusion in the country, on the one hand, an official does not provide accurate information here and now and the public uh, stays in uh, information uh, uh, isolation and people start rumoring on some arguments and uh, unreliable sources uh, referred to on the one hand uh, by tradition this ban for civil servants to use uh, smartphones at work we kind of stop the slide uh, the tide of fake news but we're violating human rights and we can't give up the progress uh, uh, for the benefit of information portals. And a second problem, since this is a complex problem, the culprit uh, is also the journalists. Why our domestic journalists never burn to be the first, do not burn with the desire to be accurate. That's, an, that's one more aspect of it. And perhaps if we were to agree with our panelists speaking of role of education here, in continuation of our brief uh, lesson of philosophy, uh, intellectual developed uh, housemaker and uh, intellectual developed president will always speak the same language and they'll understand each other very easily. So the problem is also in the family, in the society, and in preschool, school, and uh, post -gra uh, graduate and postgraduate education. Thank you. With the third part of what you said, I agree. Educated uh, a homemaker and educated president, it's always good. There will always be understanding. Now, uh, responding to your first point as to why I don't think that fake uh, news do not play a major role in Kazakhstan, I was saying that fake news generally in global terms. For Kazakhstan, no matter how strange it may be, it's a young youth and news uh, uh, may uh, play a negative role and we should all fight that together. And regarding your second uh, point, as to, well, I don't see a connection between the smartphone ban for civil service and how uh, quickly they work. Uh, let me uh, provide an explanation and a comment. Government authorities in this kind of situations are always in losing position because we, unlike so-called uh, fake news, uh, uh, an individual user on the internet, we cannot answer you momentarily. We need to check if uh, someone alleges that there is a bomb there and everything is about to blow up. 
special services must first check that whether there is a bomb or not. Uh, just an, as an example, and that takes time. In the world, in the world even now, we understand that the uh, golden standard doesn't work. They uh, rush to inform the uh, population, but we're working with it. Now, the fact that the civil servant doesn't have a smartphone and he can't quickly comment, and uh, that there is no connection between how quickly they do their job. That's all. Over there. This is a question for the Honorable Minister, and it's a privilege um, to be able to address you um, directly in your own uh, context. Um, it's believed that uh, good journalism is, is helpful, actually, to the credibility of government, and this very forum is an opportunity for Kazakhstan to be able to communicate its own vision. Um, and in that spirit, in the discussion about um, fake news, um, we also see that one of the problems is the absence of news. As a media trainer, I've been uh, working with local, local journalists who tend to be a bit tentative and a bit uh, uh, um, uh, timid in their questions and their, uh, about uh, local realities and local news stories. We've heard some, uh, um, some, some, some news items that have been circulating unofficially about certain uh, sites that are not accessible in Kazakhstan. And, that, uh, and I will take, wanted to give you this, the opportunity that maybe you could clarify and help, uh, the, help us understand how, what do you see um, as, uh, as dangerous and what, uh, what, should not be, uh, what should not be shared and for what, for what reasons. And lastly, what is Kazakhstan doing to help encourage its journalists to be more, more tenacious? And, what would you, and lastly, what would you like um, international journalists and media professionals to take away from Astana in this wonderful uh, forum and to uh, share with the rest of the world about Kazakhstan's relationship to news and information? Thank you. The main threat for any nation, including Kazakhstan, is fake news. We must admit that because no single, and I'm absolutely confident of that, I don't know how it works in other countries, but no uh, government official in Kazakhstan, especially high-ranking official, is never interested in having the situation when the work they do is not reported to the people. They're interested in having quality information about the work that's being done. The other thing is that we have problems with communicating it. We must admit that because we can't uh, maybe some uh, haven't mastered the art of properly uh, delivering the accurate information about the work we do. That, that's a problem we have with civil service. It's not a problem only for Kazakhstan. I think it's a problem for many officials. A lot of work is done, but properly serving that information uh, is a problem. And I think international journals can really help us when it comes to communication between the authorities and the people help us with that, uh, organize that communication. Uh, everything else, uh, everything being done, and I'm absolutely sure uh, the situation in many countries, everything is being done to improve the uh, lives of people. So fake news actually uh, hit, first of all, government authorities, including Kazakhstan. Hello everyone, Denis Kravashev, uh, Economic Observer. In the past few months I have attended several fora, and uh, very often the theme raised is the conflict of social media, fake news, mostly looks like the inability to work with them rather than the understanding what is really happening in the technological market of media. Uh, uh, Native Americans, when they first saw a train back in the day, without understanding what it was, they uh, would attack with spears and uh, uh, bows and arrows. Uh, very often we see similar situation today when representatives of uh, conventional media uh, speak of their disappointment, including me, we simply 
are incapable of monetizing, can't make uh, as much profit as we could generate uh, before the arrival of social media, which are faster, which are more effective. It's just as they say in Russian, it's like uh, crying for the money lost. And that's the first thing. Uh, first question and my second question to uh, the moderator. You know, in Kazakhstan, uh, you're not, it's not a tradition to uh, stop people in the middle of their speech. And when our minister was stopped in the middle, it seemed to me wrong. Although we're friendly with him, but I think uh, it would be nice to let him finish his thought. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you for the, the lesson in manners. Uh, we were all supposed to stick to a certain time frame, so that's the only reason I interjected as rude as it was. So I think you were talking about the business model there, and I know that you've got quite a bit to say about that, Catherine, and, and how uh, it's hard to make money, especially with social media, and possibly the business model is to blame for, for where we are today. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the, 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 the thing is that the, um, the way of communicating are, are, uh, have just increased, right? Uh, we now, when I started, <laughs> it was in film and television, you were doing a story a day. <laughs> uh, five years later, it was a 24-hour news channel, and then, you know, radio and, and, uh, and digital, you know, the, the, uh, the web and then social media. So you multiply the distribution uh, platforms. Uh, and, the, and the thing is, you cannot do the same content. You have to be formatted different. It has to be adapted to this audience that consume it in, in different ways. So you have to, you're losing money every year, and then you have to actually multiply the way of, uh, so this, it, it, this is a dead end at the end of the day. So we have to rethink the, the, the model for sure. I think one of the solutions that media are, are, are realizing more and more is uh, is partnership is uh, you've seen it with the panama papers you've seen it with other uh, big investigation that now people are reaching out to others uh, we're doing that in canada uh, and across uh, internationally as well to uh, to be able to financially uh, continue to do investigative journalism in particular Sorry. let me add just one point on the monetary side I, I, the questioner's point is a very good one uh, about we shouldn't be crying over spilt milk, but it is nevertheless a different world. Here's a way to look at Facebook and Google uh, as tremendous advertising machines. Mm -hmm. The truth is that uh, both television and newspapers, the older methods of communicating news, depended on advertising. I'll tell you in one chart uh, a summation. In 2006, the American newspaper industry had $55 billion in advertising altogether. By 2012, because and this shows the speed of change in the technological world, it had dropped to $27 billion. That is cut in half in six years. Meanwhile, uh, there is one line on the same chart that shows in 2012, a 13-year-old company at that point named Google had 60, that's six zero billion dollars in those years, far surpassing, and of course it has only gone up. Why is that? Because Google and Facebook are also able to use your preferences in big data to, to give to advertisers direct contact about what you may be interested in. Now there's another, uh, there's an interesting uh, line if you look at the most valuable American companies, Google, Microsoft, Facebook, Apple, it's an astonishing change uh, just in 15 years. But in another part of the forest, in Amazon, uh, which uh, is run by a great digital innovator and disruptor, Jeff Bezos, he came back and bought the Washington Post at a bargain price, I might add, as a former alumnus of it and brought technical expertise to it, uh, had them start adding reporters in. The, the editor there now is uh, Marty Barron, who worked for me at the Los Angeles Times and who is the hero, we're very proud of him, of the movie Spotlight because of his time at the Boston Globe when he uh, helped launch the comprehensive investigation of the uh, uh, priest's uh, sexual uh, molestation of young people in Boston. Marty was given more reporters. He said, it's the first time in 12 years that I've been able to 
to hire more reporters. So I, there may well be some other interesting things that will develop uh, where deep-pocketed uh, individuals from the digital world may want to take over. And certainly Jeff Bezos' job at the Washington Post has given a lot of new life. But the money and following the money is, is part of the great change. Catherine? Just to add to that, that also, you know, information is valuable. Journalism is important and valuable. I think also our approach has to be less shy about, about um, you know, taking our place in terms of the value. I mean, a lot, everything is free, everything, and if we made that uh, from the beginning, now we're starting to try to catch up. <laughs> and, uh, but I think it's all right, because uh, there is value in information. And I, I think if we looked at it more as a business, uh, we probably, um, you know, without crossing the lines, you, you probably could uh, think of opportunities we're not thinking about now. Go ahead. Good afternoon. My name is Doan Yildiz. Uh, most of our speakers are coming in Europe and the West. We are uh, East part of journalists. Uh, I want to uh, say about our country, my country, own country, maybe you know or not. Turkey is the bridge between Asia and Europe. And now uh, in Turkey, more than 256 journalists are in jail, in prison. Uh, I think uh, we need European and West democracy and uh, experience of uh, journalism, freedom of journalism. And at this point, uh, in some societies, we are closing news channels and more, more than 10,000 people lost their jobs. And how the society will take the uh, normal news, not fake news, just fake is, uh, in our country now is normal. Uh, what, what, is your, what can you say about this one? Just, it is a kind of illness, just uh, pressure, uh, closing. Is, is it the uh, sol solution of such, such kind of problems? Or we are going to close our um, eyes and ears to this problem? When the ISIL is, appears in the world, people think that happens in the East, West, or they will not come to our countries. Now in Belgium, in London, in everywhere now, the terrorist attack in everywhere. I think the media should be always free. They can write everything, but if you start closing something or if you start pressure, uh, and the West should be always ask it himself, are you honest with you when something happened in Turkey or in other countries? Do you uh, say something or do you, uh, uh, your voice's volume up or down? What can you say? Thank you. Shahida? Yeah. I can say one thing. The Committee to Protect Journalists, which we work with at the Museum and a number of other uh, uh, First Amendment organizations in the U.S. have taken this very seriously. They have raised voices about it and continue to. We are not a military operation that can come and do something about it in some very specific sense, but what journalists have are their voices. And I agree with you that it is a, it is a dire situation and it is something that we continue and will continue to talk to. And if you come to the museum, we will receive you with open arms. Jahida? Um, very quick point. Um, it's very. Can't hear you. I just can't. Um, ah, okay. It ah. works now. It's horrible what's happening in Turkey. I've been following the story ever since the coup. I've been there the next day. I've been working in Turkey all last year. Whatever's happening to journalists is horrible. Uh, it's absolutely unacceptable to jail somebody or close a news outlet just because they publish something which doesn't agree with the current line of the Turkish regime. Uh, from my experience, even if you jail the journalists, they're always bloggers, people who are on tweet. They appear as a young generation of Turkish youth. Youth which has uh, voted in a referendum, 50-50, right? So that 50% of the population does not agree what's happening, and that is your hope. People who are not journalists, they're going to be bloggers, like in the Arab Middle East. 
uh, during the revolutions. That's what's going to happen to Turkish media. You, it's going to move to the blogosphere, to Twitter, and everything else. And the rest of the proper journals are going to be in jail. And there's nothing can be, do, be, can be done because from my point of view, whatever is happening in Turkey, whatever I read in Turkey, it's only one line. It's the line of AKP and Mr. Erdogan himself. And that's it. This is the only truth which is happening in Turkey. No other alternative opinion is available. Well, it's, it's, a, it's a very big topic, and we are going to have to leave it there. In my conclusion, it seems that there are so many players to blame here, whether it be the journalists or the politicians or those absorbing social media without bursting their own bubbles. And that possibly uh, journalism needs to clean up its act, but not be over-policed. And a post-truth world is definitely not in our interests. And can truth prevail? Just the fact that we're discussing it here, I think, is very important indeed. So thank you very much for inviting us to do that. And to my panel, thank you very much, Darren Abayev, Giles Kenningham, Catherine Kano, Shelby Coffey, and Shahida Tubaganova. And thank you, too.